Good morning, everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk about a uh, wave topic, which isn't exactly part of chapter 12 on sound and not exactly part of chapter 13 on light. It's a phenomenon that all waves uh, exhibit, and it's related to constructive and destructive interference. So the phenomenon we're talking about today is called beats or a beat frequency. And um, uh, so I just want to re review quickly uh, constructive and destructive interference. So here I pre-drew, uh, <laughs> with no template obviously, uh, a, a sine type wave uh, of sound or, or light or something like that, and another one underneath it. And these are what's called in phase. In other words, the crest of one wave matches up with the uh, crest of another wave, and the trough matches with the trough. And so what happens is um, you get constructive interference, Let's write a, just a C right here for constructive interference. And you wind up with a wave that is higher in amplitude, much taller. That is to say that the up parts are adding together, making a big up part. The down parts are adding together, make a big down part. So constructive interference. And this is why multiple speakers in a stereo system can be louder than a single speaker, is that the sound from each of those speakers um, adds together in constructive interference. However, if the relationship between the sine waves is off, like here they are on 180 degrees out of phase, in other words, uh, this sine wave is starting 180 degrees later on the, the sine wave shape than this one did, then you get a crest matching up with a trough and a trough matching up with a crest, and those have a tendency to cancel each out each other out, excuse me. So this is a uh, destructive or completely destructive interference. This is the concept behind the Bose noise canceling headphones and some other uh, phenomenon. Um, so, but these two things happen when the um, wavelength and the frequency are the same between the two waves. Now the, the speed of the two waves, if they're both the same kind of wave, are going to be the same because the speed is determined by the medium. So if the spacing is the same, that means that these are going to have the same frequency. And so whatever the phase relationship is between the two waves, if they're in the same frequency, you're either going to get constantly constructive, destructive, or something in the middle. What we're talking about with a beat frequency, however, is when the frequencies are slightly different. So here, and I've done a horrible job with this, but I've tried to draw two waves of slightly different frequency. They begin kind of in phase, but they rapidly become out of phase, and then maybe they're back in phase and out of phase, and boy, I've done a horrible job of, of drawing um, sine waves. But the idea is if the frequency is slightly different, between one wave and the other, then what's going to happen is you're going to go from constructive interference to destructive interference, back to constructive, back to destructive, back to constructive. And the resultant wave is going to be bigger for a little while, and then nothing, and then bigger for a little while. In other words, if this was a sound wave, this would be loud, and this would be soft in here, and this would be loud again, and this would be soft. And, and that's called an envelope. So the amplitude is high and then low and then high and then low. Now, what would this sound like to a person listening to it? Well, what that would sound like is wah, wah, wah. It would be louder in these sections and softer in these sections. So the frequency, um, uh, the difference in frequency creates a changing set of conditions for constructive and destructive interference, and it leads to a beat frequency. Um, the formula that goes along with this, and uh, we'll do that right now, the formula that goes along with this is that the beat frequency, I'll call it FB, is just equal to the difference between the two frequencies the absolute value of the difference. We don't care whether one is higher or lower than the other. We don't. There's no such thing as a negative frequency, but the beat frequency will be the difference between the two. Um, so the, a beat frequency, or beats, is a modulation or changing of amplitude caused by two different frequencies interfering. Now, if they're two wildly different frequencies, sometimes the beat frequency is something that is just uh, crazy and you would never hear it. But the closer the frequencies get, 
the smaller this beat frequency is and the slower this loud to soft change takes place. And uh, musicians will use this to tune instruments. Um, in the orchestra, and I, I'll go back to the orchestra, uh, there, there is an annoying instrument called the oboe. And um, although the sound of the oboe is quite nice, it's a very strange instrument. It is a dual reed instrument, and if sticking one piece of dry wood in your mouth is uh, not fun for you, uh, imagine sticking two. Um, but the thing about the oboe is that the oboe does not have a mechanism for tuning. The oboe is simply what it is. So the entire freaking orchestra is supposed to tune to the oboe. Now, a well-constructed oboe is probably in tune, and there's probably a small adjustment that the oboe player can make that wasn't really the design of the instrument, but, you know, hey. Um, because, you know, being wildly out of tune and asking the entire orchestra to tune to you is kind of crazy. Uh, but what happens is the oboe player plays a certain note. Let's say it's a concert C. A C. Um, and um, then, then the first chair from every other section of the orchestra plays the same note, whatever it's called to them, and they listen for a beat frequency. If they hear a beat frequency, they realize that their frequency, their note, is slightly off from the oboe. And so they make adjustments to their instrument until the beat frequency slows down to a very slow, and then eventually no more wah, wah, wah. Uh, guitar players will do this all the time. It works very well with a lot of distortion as well to play harmonics that are supposed to be the same note on two different strings but if they aren't the same note they'll they'll make a ya 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 sound and then you adjust one of the strings until the ya 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 goes slower and then you then you don't hear the ya yas anymore you're in tune um it's much better to develop this um ear uh thing for tuning rather than relying on electronic tuners um just so that you understand what's going on. Now, the same idea of beat frequency uh, in music is used to create a pleasant sound. Um, I, I worked in a recording studio for a while, and if we had a violin part, we never tracked it, which is one violin. One violin playing by itself sounds mm, kind of uh, thin and small, unless you're looking for that kind of sound. Um, if you want like a stringy kind of sound, you, you, you track the same violin part three times. Maybe you get three different violinists, or maybe you have the same person do it three different times. And if they do it three different times, you you get them to slightly tune the strings differently. I mean, ever so slightly, so that when the parts are played, there are additional frequencies that are coming out through the interaction of the different strings and the different playing of the part. And it has a very full sound. Um, Brian May from Queen simulated the sound on his guitar by using what's called a chorus unit, which generated additional guitar signals that were slightly different frequency from the original. And he used to send those to three different amplifiers on stage. It's not necessary to send them to three different amplifiers, but this was part of his sound and why his guitar has this big orchestral type sound uh, to it. Um, I've seen beat frequencies in uh, very odd places. Um, the first time I remember seeing it um, and knowing what it was, and not knowing what it was, excuse me, I misspoke, um, was uh, I was sitting in my uh, uh, mom's car. I got to ride in front because I'm the oldest uh, uh, child. And um, across the way from us, we were waiting to turn left at a light, were two cars. Okay, you're going to get uh, my incredible, awesome car uh, picture. And they were also looking to turn left. So their left hand blinkers. Well, they were in two different places, probably, were blinking. And um, what's really interesting about this is I, I got to sit there for like about four minutes and just watch these blinkers. Now, at first, the two blinkers were blinking at the same time, but one of them was at a slightly higher frequency than the other. So they began to get one ahead of the other, and then eventually they were blinking opposite each other. And then I watched for a little while longer, and pretty soon they were blinking together, and then a little faster, and then opposite again. And so it went back and forth through together to opposite to together to opposite, and that was a beat frequency, and I just didn't know it at the time. And now that I've told you about that, you can check this out. Uh, certainly, um, even cars of the same manufacturer, uh, the timing element for the uh, the blinker circuit is oftentimes a mechanical device. Uh, it makes a clicking noise, um, and you can hear it underneath the dashboard sometimes. And those mechanical devices aren't all perfectly calibrated uh, to do this. But certainly from different manufacturers, you're going to get different rates of um, <coughs> of, of uh, blinking. There's also a guy by the name of Steve Mould, and he did a um, a video on the beat frequency relationship between the shutter of a camera and a LED light, and showed that when you uh, 
video, uh, LED lights, sometimes you get very interesting things happening. Also dangerous if you use a camera to observe the world around you and uh, say an autonomous car um, is trying to see if somebody's turning left or right, but the camera that they're using has a certain shutter frequency and the LED light is, is inherently blinking at a certain frequency, there might be a case where the uh, camera on the autonomous car doesn't see the blinking light and doesn't know that person would be turning left or right. This is a very good video to, uh, to look up. It's also related to something called the wagon wheel effect. And the wagon wheel effect, you can see this when you're driving around as well. Um, you can look sometimes at the wheels of cars, and sometimes uh, when there's spokes on the wheels, so here's the tire, here's the wheel inside, and maybe there's the little cutouts, and they're spinning around like this. Sometimes the wheel looks like it's spinning in the direction it's going, and sometimes, even though you know that the wheel is going this way, the center part of the wheel looks like it's moving backwards. And that is a beat frequency effect between the spacing of the spokes in the wheel, frequency of the spokes going by, which is proportional to the speed of the car, and some other frequency, the frequency of eyesight. And you might say, well, Harmon, this is not a, a camera with a mechanical shutter or an electronic shutter that takes you know 40 pictures per second or 50 pictures per second or 60 pictures per second. What, how does your eye have a certain frequency associated with it? And that has to do with um, your physiology. Oh boy, how do you spell physiology? Um, you see, your brain collects signals from your nervous system for every instant in time that you experience. And unfortunately, the travel time for nerve impulses to get from your toes to your brain, which is the longest distance it travels in your body, is a certain number of time. Now, I'm going to make up a number, okay? Let's just assume that this is three microseconds, is the amount of time for a nerve impulse to get from, uh, from your toe to your brain. And so that means that what happens is your brain learns to wait three microseconds to collect all the nerve impulses from your body and then to experience that as a single instant in time. In other words, it integrates all of the experiences for every three microseconds and calls that one one frame of your life, one instant of your life. And then it does it again. And it does that so that if somebody has dropped something on your toe, and you can experience it in the same instant that your brain is categorizing as now. Um, that means that everything that you see in the real world is integrated every three microseconds. And if there is a beat frequency between the frequency of these wheels going by and your three microsecond nerve impulse, and again, I've made this number up. I don't know what it is. I'm a physics, physics teacher, not a, not a biologist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but this is a really interesting phenomenon. And uh, some people have said that the experience of deja vu is related to this uh, integration time that your brain uses. In other words, you could have a thought and have it again within the same three microseconds and your body would become confused because it had that thought before, but not your body, your brain would become confused. Uh, it had that thought before, but it is happening at the same instant. So you, uh, it's abnormal. Um, and, and that's just an artifact of this integration time that we all have in our bodies. Okay, so you can look up stuff about the wagon wheel effect. I posted some videos. Beat frequencies are tremendously uh, interesting. I had an idea a few years ago. I thought, what if Western music was really based on beat frequencies? Remember, hidden within the frequency of a string or anything like that is this harmonic series um, where V is the velocity of the waves on the string or the velocity of sound for a wind instrument. And so all of these, this sequence of frequencies that comes out every time you pluck a string or blow across a pipe, um, they all interact with each other. I said that if this was um, a C, this is also a C an octave higher. This would then be a G, and then this is a C again, and then I think this next one might be an F or a D. Don't quote me on that. But there's other note names hidden inside of the frequency so they sound good together. I thought to myself, what if the reason why certain intervals in music, like on guitar, a fifth sounds really good. It's what's called the power chord. If you were to play an A and an E above it and 
you know, crank on some distortion, you would uh, start just about every ACDC song. So I, I looked it up using the beat frequency formula. Um, A4 is 440. That's one of the reference uh, frequencies. And if you played the E above it, which would be E5, I looked that up, and that is 659.25 hertz. By the way, these are not even intervals because the math on this stuff doesn't work out perfectly. And so we have to jimmy things around a little bit to get what's called an equal tempered scale. Uh, if you're into music, you should learn about that because there are some things you can do to play around with that. And so the beat frequency, whoops, the beat frequency you would get by subtracting these two is 219.25 hertz. And I said, well, what if that was another note? And I looked it up, and son of a gun, there is an A, A3 is 220 hertz. And I say that these are so close that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So by playing an A and an E, you get this other A coming in an octave lower. I thought, oh my God, I've just solved uh, the world. Okay, well, uh, what, if, what if we go and we do this again? What if we played uh, E5? And now we're going to play the uh, fifth above that, E5 again being 659.25 hertz. And now we play B5, which is the fifth above that. Then that's 987.77 hertz. And the frequency of the beat here is uh, 230, uh, 328. Ooh, I'm dyslexic. 0.52 hertz. Okay, is there another note? Well, it turns out the closest note here is F4. And F4 is 329.23. And that's within uh, hertz or so. So these could be this could be the same. When you play an E and a B, you get another. Oh, here's the problem. That closest note F is not something that sounds good with E or B. In fact, it is an F, which is one, uh, one step uh, different. No, E and F is a half step. Holy crap, that's great. Um, uh, uh, this is half a step different. And um, if you've ever played two notes on the piano that are right next to each other, like a white key and the black key that is right adjacent to it, you know that that doesn't sound that good. Now, what I'm describing here is a white key and the black key that would be next to it, but then an octave lower. That's not so bad. But it certainly isn't this nice other A, which has this reinforcing thing. So I think my theory that I came up with, that, that beat frequencies create this relationship that makes... Um, um, consonant and dissonant intervals in music. I think it's wrong. I think it's all built in to the harmonic series. Anyway, that's a quick little uh, lecture on beat frequencies. Now that I've described this to you, you'll see them everywhere. Um, and I hope that you can find a video where someone plays some beat frequencies and does some stuff for you. I left you a link. You should be able to follow it. Okay, uh, that's it for now. We're going to move on to chapter 13 on light. Uh, light and color and then uh, chapter 14 is on light and optics like lenses and mirrors and stuff and I'm going to blur all that stuff together because there's just no reason at this point to be a slave to a textbook and chapter so look for uh, short videos to come out every other day uh, about the phenomenon of light.